said, episode 53. You know what we did last week, episode 52? What I learned when I sold my shop. It's out there and you can listen to it while you're, you're on your commute. It was very interesting. A lot of interesting secret sauce came out of that one. And next week, one of Jude's favorite subjects, it's titled next week, Stay Up on Social Media. What do the Facebook changes mean to your marketing campaign? And, and also something very interesting. Watch for this soon. The podcasts are going to be available for credit on AMI. We've uh, already got six of them submitted, and uh, you're all going to hear about that real soon. So I'm excited about that. Hey, everyone. Glad to have you here. And uh, what's, what's exciting? always exciting is to uh, welcome Jasper as a supporter of the Town Hall Academy. You know, your customer's old engine or transmission is going to wear out. And when that and when that day comes, Jasper will be the name to remember. Jasper's re remanufactured products cost considerably less than a new vehicle. So it just makes sense to choose Jasper for your customer's drivetrain solutions. Thank you, Jasper, for your support of the Town Hall Academy. I'd like you to meet Jude Larson, shop owner, from Valley Repair and Business Coach Consultant from JML Real Solutions, and Darren Barney, owner of Barney Brothers Off-Road in Grand Junction, Colorado, and Donnie Carter, service manager at Little Wolf All Automotive in Wapaka, Wisconsin? That's uh, close enough, yeah. Wapaka, How would you Wisconsin. say? Wapaka? <laughs> As some people say, Wapaka. Uh, Wapaka, that'll, that'll work. Cool. Glad to have you here, guys. Um, interesting topic, improving communications between the service advisor and technician. Jude, I want to ask you, I've heard you say before, uh, shifting and thinking from playing with a hot potato uh, with repair orders, uh, why should we work hard to produce a masterpiece RO? Sure, Carm. Um Typically what I see happening in a shop, and I've, I've done this myself when I was a service advisor, um, it's sort of the mentality of, I need to get rid of this. It's not my problem anymore. And so the advisor gets, you know, this, this problem in front of them, and they're just like, oh man, how fast can I get rid of this thing? And so they do the minimum effort that they think they can get away with, and then they just toss it to the next person who's responsible for it. And, uh, then the same thing reciprocates back and forth and it's everybody doing the minimum and it just continues to kind of degrade to a point where um, the product is very, very inferior. And what um, I actually learned this years ago when I was uh, doing mortgage brokering, I met an individual who um, he would turn in, most people would turn in a loan file that was just a pile of garbage. I mean, it was just papers and they were basically hoping to, I think, confuse the underwriter into approving the loan. Like they just so overwhelmed them with the, the huge pile they had to go through. They're just like, oh, I don't know, just push it through, whatever. But what he would do is he would, he would write um, this like, like masterpiece novel how-to. I mean, it was just beautiful. Every single item in there um, was perfect. He would leave instructions for anything that had a question about it. And so the underwriters got to uh, know his files so well that when they saw one come across the desk, they would go, Oh, look, it's one of Neil's files. Oh, this is making my day. And they'd put it down. They were super excited. They'd go through it. It was just beautiful. No question. I mean, it would just, it would fly right through. And when I saw him doing that and I saw uh, the results he was getting from that, a light bulb went on. And I went, oh my gosh, that is where it's at. That's where you need to be. And then fast forward, moving into the, you know, the automotive uh, or back into at that point, the automotive industry, I see the same thing that typically think, like I said, things are just thrown to, it's your problem now, not mine. And then you, you solve it and they do the minimum versus, you know, if you, if you walk out or, or push the button to send the you know, repair order to your technician and they are used to getting an absolute masterpiece from you. There's no questions. They don't have to come in and ask what's going on with it. What does this mean? I don't understand. You know, my favorite or, well, not my favorite. The opposite of my favorite is when they get an RO and it will just say like advise, like, what do you do with that? You know, it's like, and, and then you, you know, you got on there, you're going to, you're going to charge your customer, you know, 150 or 300 bucks or whatever it is to advise. I mean, what, what, you know, there's no information. So they're just 
running down. And then if they don't bother coming back and asking questions, they're running down a rabbit trail after something. And, they, you know, they may, hey, I diagnosed it. Well, what'd you diagnose? This thing. Well, they were curious about that thing, actually. So, you know, it just, it just causes all sorts of mayhem. I so love it. You, a masterpiece. Don, uh, you yeah. agree with that? Well, there's the approach is I think we start, uh, you know, at the counter with our customers and it's up to us to bring that masterpiece to our technicians presentably so they can, um, they can do their best to work with us. It, you know, it starts when you, st uh, from the technician standpoint, in my opinion, I've never was a technician but I've probably worked with about 75 in my career. And the one thing you always know from a technician is right away when we start our morning, we have to have as big and as, as, as perfect of a game plan that we as advisors or managers can put out there for them. It's never going to be perfect. We all know that in the course of a day, but I believe that these technicians, if, if they have a certain path to follow on each and single, every single day, that the results will be much more favorable than if they're they're throwing a dart at the dartboard. Now, Darren, he just said something very interesting about start in the morning. Is there a important part of your day that engages your whole team as a good start in the morning? There is, and it's something that uh, we do every morning at the shop, and it's great. We have everybody at a morning meeting. And it's a short little meeting, but we just basically go over the day. And so we talk about uh, each one of the technicians and what uh, their individual jobs are, any concerns that uh, may need to be addressed with the vehicles. And then we go over uh, any other things that uh, need to be brought up. Works really well, though, because it kind of creates a, a feeling of camaraderie and helps everybody to kind of be on the same page so that when a guy drops off his vehicle and you know that last time he was in, he wasn't taking care, good care of, um, it helps out that the guys on the counter can then give him a little extra love and, and support. Or we know that this person has to be done by 2 p.m. If everybody's on the same page, when that customer calls and says, hey, what's the status of my vehicle? Everybody knows, oh, yeah, you're the one that needed to have that back by 2 or whatever it may be. So, I mean, I think that's one of the big secrets to creating a successful shop is having everybody together in a meeting together. Even your UPS or your will call person, whatever it is, everybody is all on the same page because that UPS or shuttle guy then is aware that this guy once again had a bad experience last time. So he gives him a little extra love. It just kind of helps to get everybody to, to tailor that good customer experience. Interesting. Um, Donnie, uh, to motivate techs to produce billable hours, do you have to have that masterpiece in novel? I'd like to see, I'd like the guys to see the product, <clears throat> excuse me, to see the game plan. Um, and, and one thing is we, we try to present a competitive uh, uh, element to this. Um, me personally, I'm com very competitive. Uh, and I, I, I hope that my technicians um, are competitive as well to a certain extent where they can see the, the top of the mountain. They, they can see where we want to go. And it's not just gross profit. It's not just looking at all these numbers, but it's at the end of the day, the end of the week, end of the billing cycle and, and payroll cycle that I did this. And I think it's important to, um, to, to our technicians of today, because it, it is, let's face it all across the, 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 the country, there's a, there's a shortage. And I think if we can put this back where um, there's uh, accountability from their side and, and accountability is a big word uh, be, for the standpoint these some technicians don't worry about it the guy at the front he'll take care of it for me no we're all in this together I think we all got to uh, know our game plans and I think the, the the accountability aspect of it puts them in 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 a, a spot where these guys are trying to succeed even more every day they see the numbers the big jobs they see the little jobs they know it's on them to get this work done but they know they have help behind them to achieve those goals. Guys, you know, when I looked at this subject and then I looked at your talking points, I couldn't help but distill it all down to is digital an important facet of improved communications? I think it's going to continue to become more and more so. I mean, it, 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 it takes a process that used to take X amount of time and it shrinks it considerably. So you have time. But, but, does, but, but, but Jude, it shrinks it. But is it clearer because you're forced to check a box or write something? Because 
I, I met someone a few weeks ago that purposely built a brand new facility where the service counter and the bays were very far from each other, mm-hmm. <laughs> distant. And it was designed so that the communications between the two through their digital program was more effective because they realized that I've got to walk all the way back there. Or I've got to walk all the way up front. Right. Right. And, and it was on purpose. It's a, it's a, almost like a, a great topic for today's academy because we're talking about building stronger communication. Didn't mean to interrupt you, but no, I, had, I had to ask that. Yeah. I mean, it's a great point because, you know, with a clipboard and paper, you can't force them to fill in that box. You can't force them to go to the computer and type it in. But with that type of a process, there are some of them where they quite literally cannot move to the next step until they've completed the task in front of them. And so it can make it more thorough. It can do, you know, all sorts of, of good things. So I'm a big proponent of it. I like it. I agree with it. Uh, like, like Jude said, for me, it's a tough sell from the standpoint, I still play Atari. So, um, <laughs> you know, I'm it for the computer age is different. When I started, you know, we didn't have computers. So um, it's a transition. And I think it, again, it goes back to accountability as well. These techs know that, you know, I won't fill this box out this time. Once, once they get, uh, you know, certain called the task a few times, they pick up on it. And I have some gen- gentlemen here today that um, they now look forward to filling out the, p- the proper way on the on their sheets on the computer, and and it's it, it holds them accountable, but it also helps them in their process. Darren, digital is a helper in the communications process. That's wonderful. It really is. Uh, Bolt-on actually, which is the one that we use, allows us to go and track um, each one of the individual inspections and how thorough the technician was on those inspections. So every day I can go and click on a report that tells me how in-depth they did and if they actually took the time and took pictures, which is what they're supposed to do when they find a part that's bad, um, if they've taken that picture and if they actually competed or completed the full inspection. It also tracks the amount of time the technician takes. So it's nice to know that, hey, how did you do a, you know, a good inspection on this 71 Jeep um, in, in five minutes? There's no way. So it's nice because we can, can track those things and then uh, you know, encourage them to improve in certain areas and uh, not spend so much on others. So there's the accountability that Donnie was talking about. Now, Donnie, if you get a new tech who starts, he started last week, could you give us an example of what you would do in, in an orientation process that would start that communications, you know? Well, I think anybody that's new at anything has to get comfortable with the surroundings, not just in the digital aspect of it, other technicians they work for, where to uh, acquire um, shop materials. To to take someone new most of the time in this in this day and age most of uh, the techs we look at um, uh, what are they going to do their first week their first month and and you, you kind of start them off slow but I would think that if I were getting a new tech um, I, the expectations as far as the product are the same but as far as uh, in numbers and uh, that type of thing as far as uh, productivity and that uh, I, I give them a pass for a certain amount of time because I want these people to feel comfortable around not only myself but the gentlemen they're working with out there and as well as what they're working on I think that's just as important and how you do things in a shop is is the same way a professional sports team or any sports team uh, works for that matter they have a certain way of doing things once you get acclimated to that um, the comfort, you know, the comfort level for the technician is tremendous. And I think that makes a better shop when these guys come in every day with a smile on their face, ready to go to work, comfortable, what's going to happen in transitions from, from job to job. And I, I tell you, when these guys are happy and they come up to you at the end of the day or end of the week and say, I love working with you. Um, there's nothing better than that. It just, it's, it's what you strive for in this business. Fortunately enough, I've had uh, several great techs in my in my career and um, it it makes you drive on for them as much as anything else can you out serve each other jude um no you actually can't but you can sure try um it's just a shift in mindset um rather than doing the hot potato thing we're doing the minimum you can get away with i, I used to hear, hear the phrase years ago 
people will work just hard enough to not get fired and uh, and bosses will pay you just enough for you to not quit you know and it's just doing the minimum standards on each end and if you flip that around um, actually the first place I heard this concept was uh, in in a marriage class and they said why don't you think about it from this perspective what if you both are just trying to outserve the other? Like you're just giving and giving. I mean, it works really well if you're both doing it. Not so well if just one of you is doing it. But the idea is, um, you're you're there to serve the tech, to help them, to make their job as as, as easy and free flowing and uh, as many hours as they can bill. You know, uh, I mean, it's a hard job. It's hard work. All of it is. But you, if you focus on helping each other through it and serving each other through it you're going to get uh, way better results. I heard a great um, lesson on marriage. Um, I'd like to piggyback on what you just said. Yeah. It was the 60-40 rule. And so, Mr. Husband, I want you to be a giver of 60% of your time, your attitude, your mind share to your wife. And um, wife, I want you to give 60% of your time, your mind share, your attitude to your husband. <laughs> And if you both work that program, you'll meet in the middle at 50-50. <laughs> yeah, that's clever. Thanks for bringing that up. Hey, um, Darren, how important is listening in the communications process? Oh, it's a huge thing. It really is. It's a big thing. Um, it's something that we try to talk with on our guys about making sure that as you're talking to another person that uh, you're paying attention to the color of the eyes. Because if you're paying attention to the color of the eyes, then you're actually uh, really listening and really devoting uh, your full attention to them. And so as a technician will come up and talk to my service advisor or to one of my counter guys, I um, want to make sure that, uh, once again, they're listening and really paying attention to those fine details. Because as technicians sometimes get frustrated with the job that they're working on and they come up to talk about a problem with the part or whatever it may be, if they remember to make that eye contact and to notice the color of the eyes, then they're going to listen more involved and uh, make sure that they're uh, yeah, taking everything that needs to be. Cool. And uh, I've heard you say before, uh, please pause before you answer. <laughs> That's something that uh, I've had to work a lot with because as <clears throat> the business owner, a lot of times, um, if somebody is upset, I, I'm the one who gets to hear about that. And so a lot of times what I've done in the past, I would get upset and I would just go straight out to the tech and talk to him and find out what happened and kind of uh, uh, drill him a little bit. And I have learned now that I have to ask all of those involved and in starting with counter guys or service manager, depending on who it was, and then speak with the technician. So I've kind of got a little bit of a, a of backstory, if you will, because you find out from a customer that's really riled up and upset about something. And then you go and talk to everybody involved and it's come to find out the person was just having a really bad day and uh, blew things out of proportion compared to how, what the customer portrayed it as. And that doesn't always happen, but it has happened a few times where I go out and attack the guy first. And then he's like, wait a minute here, I'm just doing what I was told to do. And then all of a sudden it creates all this animosity and, and people being frustrated and mad where kind of take your time and do things the right way. Then uh, your energy, your anger is not way up here and you come down a little bit and it just, it just seems to work better. Yeah. The flip. great pause, you know, thank you for bringing that up. I think, it, I think it's a critical piece in the communications process and, uh, and sometimes you got to be judge and jury, right? That's correct. You do. And that's the other thing that I think is important too. And we also work with the guys on this as well is that after a customer is done talking or a technician or whatever, you give that three to five seconds of pause, let them sit and think so that if there's anything else they're going to add, they're going to do that rather than you jumping in and then changing and sidetracking what they were talking about. If you stop and let it sit. Yeah. Yep. Don't listen to reply. Listen to learn. That's right. Hmm. Very good stuff. Hey, why purchase a Jasper quality remanufactured product? Well, it's their people. We're talking about people. A Jasper associate is dedicated to high quality customer service, committed to excellence, professional, and has pride of ownership as part of a 100% associate owned company. Thanks Jasper for your support of the town hall Academy. Donnie, can good communications prevent comebacks? Absolutely. I think Number one, I think that's where it would start. Obviously, communications at the counter um, through 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 the service writer, and of course back to the the uh, technician. But that would be that's when we find, when we look at comebacks. Number one, that is the the uh, the crux of the matter is communications. And I don't like to play the blame game. 
uh, if there's a break in that communications because it can happen. And uh, to me, it's a matter of run the next play, let's get it going, and let's correct it. But absolutely, communications is, is number one. Talk to me about QC in that. Well, I think, again, it brings back accountability from the technician. And if he has any questions to come to me or come to the service writer who is handling that case. Um, and I always leave an open door for communications with my customer. Because at the end of the day, we, we're working on it, trying to get the same goal, to achieve the same goal and that is complete a repair uh, with everybody on board, making every, all the parties happy. And that may require some more information from a customer, which I have had no problem in the past. Um, and I will, at the counter, tell them that I might need some more information um, to complete this. And you're part of this team as well to achieve this goal. But the quality control at the end when these, when these technicians are finished with a certain project um, it's up to them uh, on the repair side. It's up to me on the delivery side. And we kind of shake hands in the middle and say, are we ready to go? Is this, is this vehicle ready uh, uh, to move on? So um, that's the quality control. I think in my, in my years of doing this, I, I'll tell you, it's always, again, a team effort. And I think it starts with communications right down to the QC at the end of that, uh, at the end of that job. The guy in the bottom right-hand corner, just the techs and just the service advisors need to communicate, or does it go beyond that? Um, everybody who's, uh, you know, playing the game, so to speak, needs to be involved. I mean, you can't just have the techs and the advisors and then, you know, the rest of the leadership is completely clueless. Maybe nice if it worked that way. But I would suggest that if, if you are able to do that, then you have something more than just an, an advisor, meaning you've given them a bigger role. You know, they're taking on uh, leadership and, you know, steering the, the, the ship and everything. So where's the owner come in? Uh, well, they're all over it, Depend, depending on where they want to be and where they decide to be. If they're, you know, if they're an absentee owner, they, they you know, do the, uh, the four hour work week type thing, then they've obviously handed that off to somebody else and they, and they need to give them the freedom to do that. They can't be in every single little detail. They're going to slow down the process. Um, but depending on, you know, where the owner fits, like I'm, when we're done here, I'm going to run the front counter at the shop for the rest of the day. You know, so in that case, I'm in the middle of all of this. I've got to live this and breathe it and do it. Um, so it, it really depends on, you know, where the owner is. If, if they're still in the building phase, obviously they haven't built the company to its level and it's, and it's, you know, maintaining and all that, and they have a leader put in place, then they they have to be very intricately involved in it. Jude, are you covering for the service advisor or is it something you said, hey, it's my day of the week to get in there and, and stay in the thick of it? Um, yes and no. Um, I am covering for him, but I'm actually um, uh, moving more into that role for a season just because I want to I want to rein the ship to a certain place. And so I'm stepping in and taking over for a while. Excellent. Um, Darren, talk to me about blame. I know you had, you had mentioned that it's really critical that you're careful in that area. Um, yeah, it's something that as the owner or as a manager, I really think that when you have a problem that's presented to you, that you look at all of the sides, just like I said earlier, I think it's very important that that blame um, – is not just thrown on the, the shoulders of the person who, who did the problem because the person that did the problem, if other procedures were in place correctly, let's just say that there's uh, dirty prints on a, you know, on a, on a door handle. Okay. If the technician did not wipe that down after he was done, sure he's at fault, but it's also the fault of the person that second checked that job or the person that walked out there with the customer to give them their vehicle keys. So therefore, it's not necessarily just that technician's problem. It's everybody's problem for not catching it in all the following steps. Yes, if I knew about those fingerprints and I didn't tell the technician about that 
and say, hey, you forgot to wipe down this, this, this door handle here, then that's my fault. And I'm the one who messed up. But I think that as an owner, we're the ones who really have to kind of take that majority of the responsibility upon ourselves to make sure that those procedures are in place to fix those problems so that they're stopped before the customer, you know, recognizes or, or realizes what the problem was. So I think plan is something that, yeah, it's exactly it. Just it is extreme ownership. It's a great book. Yeah, really great, good book. great book. Yes. It um, is. Boy, great book. Yeah. Um, and when you get to the, uh, to the, uh, when we release the episode and we, and you look at the show notes page for this episode, you'll see the additional um, podcasts that both Darren and Jude have been on and Donnie, thanks for joining us for your first time. It's great to, have, great, to have, great to have a first timer. Jude, um, you talked about the five behaviors to me. Uh, can you yeah. help us with that? Sure. Um, it, that's actually an interesting uh, discovery or I guess thing that I've been working on building. Um, how that actually came to be was uh, I had a, a friend shop owner who came to me with this exact thing. He said, we're doing really well. We're having a lot of success. Numbers are good. He goes, but you know what the one thing is that we're really, really fighting? How do I get my techs and my advisors to work with each other, to talk with each other? And, you know, I have done some training with that in the past, and they had done some training with that in the past, and there was different things. Um, but I kind of set out to, to, to search, to create, to find something that was viable and usable um, uh, for uh to help with that, to something, you know, something newer, something uh, with, with new information. So anyway, so there's a program, uh, the uh, Patrick Lencioni, I think his name is, is pronounced, wrote a book called The Five uh, Dysfunctions, Dysfunctions of a Team. Yeah, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And, um, and they, they build on each other, you know, as you kind of go up this pyramid shape of, um, I thought I had one laying around here, but maybe I don't. Anyway, um, so you, you build on these as, as the team in, improves in the different areas and uh, you can get a, a scoring of where your team is at in these five areas and then be able to specifically work on each of those areas. Um, so it, it, it's really a great program. It's cool. What, what areas? Um, well, let me just uh, go ahead, steal the book, bring, the out book. A, bring out a book here for you guys. Whoops. That's the wrong one. Um, Now these are all empty. Hey, I listen, while really you're doing out. that, while you're looking for that, Barry Barrett yes. asked us a question. He's on the Zoom platform with us. Barry. Oh, Barry, yes. Right Any on. Any active listening techniques that you suggest? Active listening techniques. And, I'll, and while you're looking, I'll ask that question to Darren and Donnie. Perfect. Go ahead, Donnie. <laughs> we we'll let him in. Uh, uh, active listening techniques. Boy, oh boy. I've, you know, listening is not my strength. I'll be honest with you. Uh, listening. Uh, I'm, I'm a talker. Um, and get does, that make you a, does that make you a really good service manager then? <laughs> um, I, I sure hope so. <laughs> and I sure try. Um, yeah, I think listening, the actual count of, like I said, count the three to five seconds or a couple minutes and concentrating. <clears throat> I'd like the eye, uh, the eye test where you, you look at the color of someone's eyes just to listen to someone's voice. Um, if you ask my wife, I'm probably not a very good listener at all, but uh, I still know the color of her eyes. But after she it's... tells you this over and over, <laughs> Bonnie, uh, and she starts testing you, what did I say? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, honey. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. And you're answering things you have no idea what you're answering, right? That's, yeah, that's, after 30 years, that's kind of how it works. <laughs> well, and, you know, to, to add something to this, though, that I think is really critical is that if you try to remember that whoever you're talking to is the most important person in the world right now, in your world right, right now, it really helps you to focus in and they yeah. can feel that. Yeah. Absolutely. I you agree know, with that 100%. So, if we just do that alone, that that's right a, there is going to make it's a huge great difference. technique. Great yep. technique. You are the most important. Look them, look them in the eye. Find out the color of their eye. Those are some. It's a great question, Barry, and I think we got a couple of great answers. Now, Jude, back to the five behaviors. Sure, I have a quick answer to that though. The best thing that I've used for active listening is uh, having the participants repeat back 
what was said to them in their own words. So they have to actually take the information in, process it, and then move it back out in their own words. And then the person who they're saying it to says, yes, you got it, or no, that's not it. And you keep that process going until you get a yes, that's it. And it's funny because if you're, if you're trying to de-escalate something, for example, and using active listening to do that, as you go back and forth, I'd be surprised if you made it twice back and forth without that thing being resolved. Because active listening is it's very, very powerful. It, it's Because so often the conflict comes from what? From us not communicating well, not understanding, I thought he meant this, I thought they meant that. But in reality, they meant something completely different. So great, great question, Barry. Um, and, and by the way, a very good answer. Um, my friend Barry offered up six active listening tools. Now, Barry, my friend Barry needs to come on and do this with us. I, you know, here they are. Effective pauses, minimal encouragement. Uh, I'm sorry, minimal encouragers, mirroring, which is really cool. Paraphrasing, which you just brought up, Jude. Summarizing and labeling. And I'm sure there's some really good deep stuff behind that, Barry. Uh, now that uh, Barry brought that up, we may just have to um, do something with that. So back to the five behaviors, Jude. Yeah, you bet. That's a, that's a whole program in and of itself. It is. You could easily spend that. So I don't know how well everybody can see. This is actually off of a class that I taught last weekend. But these, this is the five behavior pyramid kind of stacked up. And it gives a scoring in each one showing where this particular team scored in these areas. And so you've got, you know, green, yellow, and red. Red obviously being problems of uh, concern. So how they stack up is the, the, the base or foundation is in trust. So if the team doesn't have trust in each other, in the owner, in, you know, everybody that's in that participant, uh, that's participating on that team, you uh, you're kind of dead in the water from the gate. I mean, it's really difficult to, to build from there. So the second step up is conflict. How do you use conflict properly? You know, uh, how it's used to get new ideas and be creative and things like that when it's being when it's being used properly. Versus, oftentimes what happens is it just shuts down. Just conflict is it just shuts the gate and nobody does anything. So there's also commitment. Uh, and I can't go into all these. I know we have time limits. Accountability, which is huge. I mean, that's like the number one thing with just about all shop owners is they say, I need accountability, I need accountability, I need accountability. And then finally, that all leads to the results. And so these all build on each other to make this, you know, pyramid, like the old food pyramids or whatever. This is the successful team pyramid. So, and that's based on, uh, like I said, Patrick Lencioni's stuff. Yeah, it's a great book. It's a good read. It's it's uh, it's perfect if if you uh, if you're leading a team. Um, good stuff, Jude. Thank you, and thank you, Barry, for your stuff. Uh, Donnie, can good communications help you manage your bays better? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's their world out there. Uh, the technicians, it's their playpen, and uh, fortunate technicians have more than one one bay to uh, to play in, so to speak. So, you know, if if we start out that morning, like Darren said, with that base communications of how our day should go, um, we've seen throughout the years that uh, the productivity goes up when these guys understand that. Uh, they can bring an automobile in, shake it down, do what they have to do there um, with, with the, the knowledge in the back of their head that they can bring a second one in. Typical things have been going on for years in the automotive business with that, but they understand that it's, it's the productivity part of it comes in where they can manage their time and, and with that, their space. And I think um, I might be very lucky or – um, you know, I don't know what are, what the words to put in place there, but I have, I have technicians uh, even here that are fantastic with that, that we, we kind of know uh, which, should, you know, what we're thinking about as far as our game plan of, of the base. And uh, I think in every shop, um, I know uh, Darren and Jude would know that you have a, a certain dollar number for every bay that's, that you have in your building. And, um, I think w one thing is if the techs understand that this is what this has to produce, um, their productivity goes up because they know when, uh, when to deal with each one, each bay or each one of three, whatever they need. Donnie, as the service manager, what kind of questions do the techs come to you with? Well, from tools to uh, 
when are we going to get air conditioning in the shop um, to uh, what time should we do lunch? It, there, it varies. There's, there's questions that are uh, sometimes even personal, um, which is a good relationship in my opinion. I think if you can share uh, outside the lines of your business, I think it, it creates a family atmosphere. And I think the technicians um, have to have, we talk about the five levels and, and the trust level, boy, that is, that gets the ball rolling. That's key. If you have the trust level um, of a brother, of a sister, dad, whatever, I think we all understand that, that that's a concept, um, not necessarily a role model, but a concept that when you come to work in the morning, you know, everybody feels more comfortable. And the, the questions they ask you, uh, I mean, that, that varies. It, most of the time it's, it's based on, uh, um, you know, they're not – I, I tell these guys, I don't need to hear questions about how to fix it. I want to know how you are going to repair this and I'll handle it from there. Um, those are the questions I need and, and to understand and accept our roles in that is, is basically what their, our conversations exist every day in that, in that regard. Do you have an open door policy with your team? Absolutely. Nothing else, but I think everybody's got to be on the same page with that. Um, it's like I said before earlier in the in the show. It's goal orientated. It's goal orientated. We have to have the same mindset, the same goal that uh, every every vehicle, every customer is, is precious to us, and we got to take care of them. If we can't get that in our heads, we might as well not open the door in, in the morning. Darren, trust in team building. Are there any things that you can do? Of course. Um, Basically, I think once again, we're getting back to respecting others and really listening to and valuing their input. Um, we have to uh, cultivate an uh, environment of, of openness and, and listening. You know, and that's something that I wanted to go back to that what Don had just said a minute ago, that you have to have your minimum levels of acceptable performance for, you know, each position in your company. And, you, and they have to know what is expected of them. But we also have to respect them as people and individuals as well. And so I think it's important that as we strive as business owners, as managers to try to get these one of these areas to really produce where we want them to. We also have to pay attention to the personal needs and you know morale of the company. Because if we're always focused on the numbers and it's like, why aren't you producing your 40 hours a week or whatever it is that may be. And yet you got the superstar that's going through a divorce or some other hard times in his life and that those numbers are going down. And if you're just looking at the numbers, you may lose this strong, awesome guy that uh, is a good member of your team. But right now he just needs a little bit of watering and a little bit of nurturing and, and taking care of and a little bit of, Hey, do you need to take some more time to do what you need to do? And then you take care of that. And then he's back to being your 50 hour a week guy. I mean, it just depends on, you know, there's such a, it's a juggling act. It really is of trying to make sure that we're maximizing those positions and yet still taking care of them as people as well. Cause I think, you know, I've heard it numerous times from people that, you know, relationships are what's makes us who we are. And those relationships are what's going to carry us through the hard times or through the good times. And relationships are critical. That's why we're here upon the earth is to establish those friendships and bonds with others. And so the numbers are important, but friendships are important too. People are important. But I think he you get the nail on the head. You know, it's, it's still a person on person business, whether it's person in your new shop you're working with or a customer, it's still people. Okay. Yeah, it's absolutely 100% true. I mean, it, it everything on planet Earth works based on relationships. And the numbers are an indicator of how your relationships are, right? I mean, that tells you what's happening. If the numbers are good, you're probably doing the right things in your relationships. I don't think you could do, like, just destroy all of your relationships and have your numbers just, ah, oh, my numbers are fantastic because I focus on them all the time. No, you got to focus on the people. I mean... I think all of the trainers in the industry will tell you focus on serving the people and the numbers will line up. I need to know what the numbers are. I need to monitor them and make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. But you have, but you can't, like you said, Darren, you can't focus on the numbers. The numbers are never going to get you where you need to go. The people are going to get you where you need to go. You have to focus on the people. Yep. And without those minimum levels, of acceptable performance, then it gives them something to shoot for. You know, yeah. when you got people that the right people in place, like they always say, you know, getting the right people on the bus, it's the critical right. thing. In the, the right, right seats people. on the bus. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. You don't That's want right. the guy in the driver's seat that shouldn't be in the driver's seat. That could be <laughs> a really scary bus ride. That's, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> you know, it. So. Don't take a five-year-old and put him behind the steering wheel. That's not going to go well. <laughs> That'd be fun, but yeah. <laughs> no seat belts on the bus, remember. That's right. <clears throat> 
Geez, I just read about that. Donnie, um, do you know the goals of your technicians? We discuss uh, short term, really. When I say short, I mean really short. Um, we have to focus, but we have to have um, a short memory too. Um, uh, certain jobs sometimes don't go the way you want them to. To achieve you know, any goal, you're going to have ups and downs. Um, and they have to understand that things to put behind them and things to look forward to. If, if you dwell on this car being a, a, I won't say it on the air, but it's a car that uh, we certain have names in shops and when, especially when they get involved in a certain, uh, certain job and then that can either carry you through as, as the rest of that way for that job and that day for that matter, or you can put it in the back of your head and move forward in a positive direction. And I think that, that should be, I don't want to get caught up in, in my technicians as far as um, uh, goals. You know, I, I want to get 60 hours booked this week, 70 hours booked this week. Um, I want them to start off and do the right thing. And, and like we talk about people, do the right thing with people and things will take care of themselves. I think when you come in on Monday morning with the attitude that everything in front of me, I'm going to do my best on. And at the end of that week, I think you're going to meet your goals. Trust relationship. Do you know their personal goals? So they were wanting to buy a house. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we, we have to have that part of our general conversation. Um, I think it, it brings you closer to each other. And uh, you know, that's here at least, um, in other places I've been at, there that's been a common thing. It, 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 casual conversation on, on goals and and people and and general interest are very key and very vital. So, as a service manager, you have to purposely find the time in your crazy schedule to build that relationship to get to know about what's going on in their world. Well, it's a, absolutely you got to know you got to know uh, likes and dislikes, um, wants and needs. Um, you, you, you want to sometimes even want to know opinions. You might not agree with them, but you still want to know them. But yeah, to get in someone's head and uh, understand how they tick, that's important. Uh, I think um, as a manager and owner, um, that's why you sit down and, and, and interview uh, somebody two, three, four times sometimes. Uh, you have to know what makes them tick, what drives them to the next, the next level to make everyone successful around you. And that's important to care about every single person that you're involved with in that business and including your customers, your clients. Excellent. Now, Jude, uh, what, with what Donnie just said, it's all about different personalities in the team and, and how to manage it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, some days, uh, if we're going to be gut level honest, it's, it feels like we're herding cats, right? I mean, it's just like there's this conflict everywhere and stuff going on, um, but it, it, it doesn't have to be that way obviously, but a lot of that does have to do with personalities. If you don't know your team's personalities, you're missing a lot of vital information. It's like trying to diagnose a car, you know, blindfolded. It's not going to be real easy. Um, if you have, for example, three people who are, you know, three techs all in a row, and all of them are very, very, score very high in social ability. They love to talk. They love to chat. They love to shoot the breeze. Um, you may find yourself constantly fighting that that lineup of where your techs are. So uh, you, you can sometimes make um, decisions based on where you're putting people. You may put an, an introvert in between two extroverts, right? So that you can you can mix the, the the flow of the shop so that these guys will can stay a little more focused. Because when you have three working together, all distracting each other it can be very challenging to, you know, get the job done and stay focused, you know, unless you're walking back and forth in front of them constantly saying, okay, keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, and the same, th you know, same thing. If you have personality up, up, up front that's dealing with all of your customers coming in the door and they're, you know, like an Eeyore or something, um, that's not building a, um, a positive image, you know, of your company. Um, people need to be, you know, just in answering the phone. I know you did a great show sometime back, Carm, on um, what do you do when the phone rings? And if, you know, if, if they're picking up the phone going, valley repair, I have to be here, you know, um, that's not going to do well as opposed to, 
uh, you know, answering the phone with a positive influx. Valerie Perrin, how can I help you? You know, you're, ha you're positive, you're happy, you're excited that they're calling you. You know, what can I do to help you kind of thing? So you need to know those things about your people and about how they mix together. And I think you need to train them on how to interact with each other. Because a lot of times you'll have people who will be having conflict and they don't realize that what that person is doing isn't personal. It's part of their 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 mindset. It's, it's just who they are. And so I've seen instances where you, you've done that type of education with somebody and the conflict went away and you, and you, you go back and you ask them, oh, well, did they stop doing that behavior? And they're like, no, I just realized it wasn't a personal attack on me. It's just part of kind of who they are. And so I'm okay with it because it's just their personality and they learn to, you know, to work inside of that. So, so yeah. how do we learn about all these personalities? Where, where is there a, a, a test to take? Oh yeah. There's lots give? of stuff. In fact, if you want Carm, um, I'll give you, I have a, like a little five minute one you can put up. That's it's, it actually works pretty well. Um, it's just a, a one sheet page. You just go down and tally up. Now it's got instructions that I can send. You can post it on the page. If I would you want. love that. Thank you so much. And, and I yeah. guess I asked the leading question only because we did a town hall Academy a while back town hall Academy 41 mm -hmm. on uh, behaviorals. Uh, yeah. All about the disc test and yep. it was, it was very interesting, exciting. And, and, it, and it shows you the dynamics of all the different type of communication styles and how well yeah. they can and will and won't work together. <laughs> yeah, that's powerful information. I have assessments I use that take that information and then compiles a, a, a report of the team and tells you where all the hot spots are and where the good blends are and all that kind of stuff. So it's really valuable information. Hey guys, um, thanks for, so much for this. Uh, I love how you've tied all this together. There's another reason to choose Jasper Engines and Transmissions. It's their commitment to continuous improvement their investment in research and development, product updates, and remanufacturing processes means Jasper provides the perfect product. I've been to the plant, saw the hard work that they do there. Excellent company. Thank you, Jasper, for your support of the Town Hall Academy. Hey, listen, I've really enjoyed this, and I want to go around the room and give you guys one last shot, some great words of, words of wisdom on improving communications between the service advisor and the technician. Donnie, I'll go to you first. Well, I think, uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody here on the, on the panel today. Excellent job. Great insight. Um, I, I would say the number one thing is uh, keep, keep, an open, keep an open mind um, and be goal-orientated uh, as far as each day. Um, we don't know if we'll get another one, but each day, just kind of an, embrace the people you're around. Uh, from the people coming in your building to your technicians and, and let's all help one another out. And I think we can uh, achieve those goals uh, along the way. I think it'll work. You're from Wisconsin, right? That is correct. You're a Packer fan? I'm a football fan, but yeah, I'm a Packer fan. Yeah. <laughs> I've been around the game a little bit, so it's, uh, I enjoy it. Um, I love sports in general, but yeah, I'm a Packer fan, but uh, I, if there's a game on it and they're not on, I'll still watch it. Trust you're, me. You're a football guy. All That's right. right. Hey, thanks so much for being here, Donnie. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Okay. Thank you. Darren, your final right. words. <laughs> um, I think one thing that we've missed that I really uh, feel is important, I don't know if it's the best thing to end on, but I think it's really important, is that the service rider or in our, in our world, our counter guys, um, are very descriptive on anything that the customer wants to be done, whether we're addressing a problem or doing a diagnostics or doing whatever it may be. I think it's very important for us as service writers or managers or counter guys to get the most description from the customer and put all that into writing, even though it looks like you're writing a book. But that way, when that technician has that, that's going to clear up so many of the, the, the mud and the misunderstandings that happen and the wasted time of going back, setting it back or walking back up front. If we just take the time to really listen to that customer and put all everything in down in the best description that we can, it's going to really eliminate a lot of the problems because if that technician knows that Mary is very particular, that she says there's a strong pull to the right when she's going above 45 miles an hour on this certain stretch of road, if we don't put that in there and the technician just says, well, you know, I'm looking for a pull to the right. So he goes and spends an hour test driving and then Mary's upset because you're billing her for an hour of diagnostics where she says, well, I told you when I dropped it off that it's at 45 on this, set, this stretch of highway on the on-ramp. And so it's so critical that 
us as once again, as owners, service writers, managers, whatever, that as we are overseeing or doing this, that we get that most description that we can because it's going to help those technicians out. It'll help to make them happy. So. I love it. I think in concepts, and as you were telling me that, Darren, all I could think of was how could I teach my service writer to do that? It would be write the novel. Yeah, that's exactly In my it. mind, okay? It would be like, write the novel. Because well, you're walking by and you're hearing the customer go, 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 write the novel. You are correct. And it's something we are always working on here is I'm always going up and I'll spot pull invoices to look at those descriptions. And I'm always, I mean, I don't hate to say writing, but I'm always reminding. It's yeah. like, hey, we got to get more description here. Yeah. You didn't get it. You, I, I heard it, but you didn't get it. You didn't write it. Remember, write the novel. Analyze and advise noise and right front. It's like, <laughs> what does that mean? You know, <laughs> we got to do a little bit more than that. So dig deeper. I did an interview and I got, I can't remember his name is probably 200 episodes ago now. All about sounds. The the uh, the shop owner actually has a web page of sounds, <laughs> <laughs> and you know you know a toaster sound <laughs> something like that. And so he would tell the customer. He says, "Listen, uh, let let's let's work on this." And, and so he would he encourages people to go to his site and tell what's what is the problem with your car car sound like. But and, see, that's awesome. That's genius. Yeah. You know, being that technician. You know what I should do? I should actually put that in, this, in the show notes episode and, and research it. It was just a fabulous episode. In fact, I gave the idea to one of the magazines to, to do a story on too. So, oh, and by the way, our 300th episode, everyone, next Friday. And Jude, before I, I give you your last word, yeah. the 300th episode is like no episode you're ever going to hear before. There were seven podcast alumni that interviewed me. Oh. Awesome. Spoiler Give you the last alert. word, Jude. Yeah, it's it's different. It's last word, man. That's awesome. Yeah, um, Darren, you couldn't have said it better. It's the perfect segue into what I was going to use as my last thing um, because it, it, that's what I was talking about when I said turning in a masterpiece. It's you 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 have to you know, write the novel, like you're saying. Um, one of the things that I, that was, that I did when I was an advisor um, to learn this was we played something called the silent game. And the owner uh, was brilliant enough to, to bring out a stack of hundred dollar bills and said, everyone can win. Everyone who does this today gets a crisp hundred dollar bill at the end of the day. And all you have to do, it's so simple. It's so easy is you have to use no verbal communication with each other for the whole day. Do the same job you do. You can't, you can't jeopardize a job. You can't have something late or delayed or put off or whatever, you know, but no verbal communication. And so today probably the equivalent would be with, with digital inspection is, you know, no messaging each other. It's all in the RO. All the communication is in the RO back and forth between the tech and the advisor. And let me tell you, when you do that, you learn very fast where the holes are, where the problems are, you know, where the hot spots are. Um, but it, it's one of those things that it, if you are brave enough to try it, um, it will uh, rapidly change the way you do uh, your communications and, and, and writing that novel, writing that whole story and the masterpiece in there because it's got to be there or you're never going to get past, you know, anything. Love it. Thank you. The silent game. I love it. Thank you. This was, this was excellent. Um, I think you tied a lot of great loose ends, the 360 degree communications package here and between the, um, between the service writer and the technician. Thank you so much to Jude Larson, shop owner at Valley Repair and business coach consultant from JML Real Solutions and Darren Barney, owner of Barney Brothers Off-Road in Grand Junction, Colorado and new to the podcast, Donnie Carter, service manager at Little Wolf Automotive in Wapaka, I think I said that right, Wisconsin. Guys, have a great weekend. Thank you for getting all ships to rise in our industry. Appreciate your input. Thanks, Thank Carm. Thanks, Carm. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.